I know it's hard when you begin the race. And at times you may feel depressed and down and out. You may feel like no hope is there for you, that you are lost. But it is in you to overcome the difficulties, to find the power within. It may feel like a war is around you, but you must surround yourself with others that will pick you up when you are down. To feel that teamwork build within you. You may feel devastated, but with your team around you, you can overcome your struggles. You can find your horizon as you go towards your goals. You have made the first step and your disabilities are now your strengths. Push past them, find the leader within you. Look within you to find the race. Push past the pain, discover who you are today. The journey may be hard, but you will discover the victor in you, the dream in you. My name is Ron Palmer and this is Real Talk. Last week I issued you a challenge, a challenge for you to better yourself in your life. We talked about a few things. We talked about passion, responsibility, and power. Have you found your passion yet? Remember that this is a marathon and not a sprint. When I talk to people that are multimillionaires and people that are successful by today's standards, I ask them over and over again, how did you know to do the things you're doing right now to make you successful? And the thing they always tell me is I had to fail first. Passion, responsibility, and power. If you implore these things together, then you will find your own power to unlock it. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about today is fear. Many people are under the impression that fear just goes away. Fear is not going to disappear from your life, but what I'm going to teach you to do is to transform your fear into another emotion and to use your fear instead of your fear using you. One great example is I have a young lady that I was working with before and she had a fear of public speaking. She told me that I will never get in front of anybody to speak, but I have to because she got a new job. She became the vice president of her organization, and she knew she was going to have to do different speeches, so she came to me for help. And then we talked about some other fears she had. Her other fear she had that was even greater was her fear of snakes. And I asked her to describe to me how high her level of fear was when it came to public speaking. She said, you know what, come to think about it, if I had a choice between holding a rattlesnake in my hand or getting on stage to speak, I would gladly hold a rattlesnake. How many of you have those kind of fears? That you would rather hold a rattlesnake than jump out of an airplane? Hold a rattlesnake than pursue whatever your dreams are? And so what we have to start doing is transforming what those fears are. I'm going to teach you some techniques for yourself and for your clients in order to transform some of that fear you may have in your life. Now, for the audience that is tuned in today, fear stands for feelings, economics, actions, and reactions. Feelings, economics, actions, and reactions. Today, we're going to primarily focus on your feelings because on your day-to-day -day activities, it is your feelings that dictate what you do or what you don't do. During the last talk, I told you that we have to figure out ways to ignore our feelings and to do what we need to do regardless of our feelings. I gave an example of cleaning your room, that we want our children to clean their rooms and they may not feel like it, and that life is like your parent, and we have to clean house and clean your room. So this is step two of the 30-day challenge. Again, I'm going to give you some red lights for you to highlight, to take with you. And I guarantee you, if you are able, if you have the courage enough to employ and use these techniques for the next 30 days, it will enable you to change your life and change the direction of your life. It will give you power of direction. And instead of fear controlling you, you will control the fear. Technique number one. When I have people that come to me and they want to get over their fear of public speaking, what I do is I use another emotion to cancel out the emotion of fear. And some may ask how I do that. I'm going to teach you how right now. So I'm going to give you a peek behind the curtain 
of my life coaching, a peek behind the curtain on what goes into motivational speaking for those of you out there that want to pursue this type of career. And also realize and recognize that every one of you is a speaker. Whether you are a salesman and you have to speak to your client, whether you're a teenager or a college kid and you have to talk this girl into going on a date with you, on your everyday life, we're all speakers. Some of us do it better than others. So step number one for you is I want you to change the way that you talk about yourself. You may ask me, what am I talking about? Well, when I brought this young lady in to talk to me, one of the first things she told me was, I am just not a good speaker. I am very shy. I can't do this. And remember last time I talked to you about changing the I can't to the I can't yet. I want you to think right now of your fears, whatever you're scared of. And for this example, we're going to use that you're scared of public speaking. I want you to say out loud, I'm not a great public speaker yet. Replace in whatever your fear is. I am not a great public speaker yet. I am shy for the moment, but I will overcome. Once we change that philosophy, that growth, then we can actually change our direction as we talked about. So what I do is, for example, I had a young lady that came in and I asked her out of everything in her life, what is the most valuable thing that she has? And she said, her child, her little girl. I said, okay, great. So now she is going to be the VP and she wants to be more successful. I said, I want you to imagine right now that your little girl, and I asked how old she is. She says she's five years old. And I want you to imagine her, and I told her to close her eyes, that she is locked into a room right now. And the only way that she can be saved, the only way that she can be rescued is by you, that she's in danger. And there's a door in between you and your daughter. And in order for you to move to the next level, in order for you to help her, you have to break through that door. I can see the veins in her neck and her mouth starting to tighten as she started thinking about this image. I told her to open up her eyes. I said, what feeling did you have? And her feeling was that of anger. She was upset because nobody is going to mess with my baby, is what she said. And so I asked her to close her eyes again. And I said, now imagine that you're going to that board that you have to talk to for a presentation. Imagine that you're talking to them about whatever it is you need to talk to them about and that the only thing stopping you is a door. And also realize it's very real that your daughter is going to do what you do and not what you say. And if you don't bust through that door, if you don't open it up and rescue her, she will follow your example. She's going to do what you do and not what you say. And immediately her fear was transformed into more anger. What I think is funny about that, I, try, I did this as well with an Army candidate. Somebody was going to an Army board. And then if you don't know anything about the military, when we go do our boards, we have a panel of our peers that's very intimidating on purpose. I had a young lady who was going to be a doctor. She was going to medical school. But, and she knew all the information. She was highly intelligent. But every time she went to one of the boards, her mind would go blank. She was from Vietnam. And I talked to her for a little bit about her experiences, and she said she wanted to be a doctor because she did not want anyone in the world to be without health care. Because it is very relevant in her country, in Vietnam, that there may be a little girl out there that may be dying for something very simple. And so I used the same scenario with her. I talked to her and I said, imagine a little girl in a dirt floor hut, and the only thing that's going to save her or rescue her as you as a doctor. I said, now imagine and picture these gentlemen on the board are the only thing standing in front of you from saving this little girl's life, and you can feel her breath start to leave, and she's starting to die. And what happened, when she went on the front of the board, her fear turned to anger, and she said it with feeling and emotion. And it came across as confidence. And she did this over and over and over again. We talked about this before, is that you have to change your ritual change your routines, fear and overcoming it. If we treated fear like we treated everything else in our lives, we'd be able to overcome it. We overcome fear in so many other ways. When you rode your bike for the very first time, you had to do a couple things. And this is what I want you to think about as we start this week's journey. I want you to think about the first time you got on your bike. 
you didn't just get on a 10 speed and ride. Because if you stuck a 10 year old on a 10 speed and they've never ridden a bike, or a kid on a 10 speed and they're downhill, the results will be a disaster. Why? Because you don't start on 10 speed. You start on a little bike with training wheels. But you out there, and the majority of us, want it now. I want to tell you that it's not the end goal that's important. It is not the riches that's important. It's the journey because you're going to build character along the way. What happens first? Is first we have to find a bike that's the right size for you. That is deciding your passion. Finding out what makes you excited. That's finding the right bike for you. And then we must change the seat and the handlebars. And you get on the bike before you even get on the road to make sure that it measures up for you. That's getting your resume together. That's surrounding yourself with people that have the similar interests with you. That's finding people that are in the profession that you want to get in. And now you're on, you're not driving yet, but you're in the driver's seat on the bike getting ready to pedal. And then we have training wheels on and we learn how to pedal and how to brake before we even get on the road. How is this? This is learning your craft. That's getting on YouTube and finding a motivational speaker if you want to be that. That is partner up with you. That's practice upon practice. That's speaking if you're afraid to speak in front of public. Over and over again, practice in your living room. Are you willing to do these things? If you are able to do all these things, then what happens? You get on the road and you start to pedal. And what happens, you get on your bicycle and the first thing that happens is you start to fall over and you fall. The great thing about riding a bicycle though that usually your mother or your father is there to catch you when you fall. Who in your life right now is there to catch you when you fall? So right now, ladies and gentlemen, what I want you to do at this very moment, and we talked about this a little bit last time, I want you to pull out your cell phones right now. Everybody pull out your smartphones because we're really about to use some smartness in our smartphones. Open up your smartphone. Find that one person in your life. It cannot be your loved one. It cannot be your mother or your father or your husband or your wife. But somebody that you're going to be accountable with. And I want you to text them right now. Even if you have to pause this show. Some of you are watching this right now on your iPhone or your Android. Pause it. Go to your contacts. Go to your messenger and say, hey, I would like you to be my accountability partner. Text them and send it to them. Put the phone away. What's going to happen now is that they're going to text you back with a whole bunch of texts, and you have about 30 more minutes left in this segment. Once we're done here, you're going to look at all these texts. Now, this is what it's, the difference is going to happen for you. I want you to get this. There are three types of speakers out in the world. The instructional informational speaker, the motivational speaker, and the inspirational speaker. The Instructional speaker is what you had in school today. They're the ones that talked to you when you were back in the school and they said, Bueller, Bueller. They weren't very inspirational or motivational. They were only there to give you information and for you to get that. And they didn't really care whether you showed up or not. The second level of speakers are motivational speakers. They're the ones that when you go to a conference or you go to a seminar, once you're sitting in that seminar, you are excited. You're like, I can do this and I can do this right now. Well, I teach people how to become inspirational speakers. An inspirational speaker motivates you in the moment, gives you some information that's relevant, but they inspire you to change. And how one way to do this is now I've incorporated somebody outside of yourself to inspire you, an accountability partner. And if somebody who you're accountable for and with is when you're in a weight room, for example, they're gonna drop the weight on your chest and tell you to push it off. Most of us don't have that in our lives. But in order for that to happen, we have to overcome our fears. I love the example of the airplane and fear. As I told you before, I am in the military. Let me tell you a little bit about my story so you can understand the levels of which I've had to go through to stand in front of you today. When I was five years old, I still had not really talked yet. And people were worried that I was ever really going to talk. And when I did start talking, the only one that understood me was my mother. And it's funny hearing the stories from my relatives, because I would talk to them. I'd be like, I do blah, 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 blah. And my mother would be like, he wants porridge. I do blah, 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 he wants to go to the bathroom. Now, Mom, I love you. I don't know how much of that was reality or how much of that was a mother's love. But I will tell you this. It was the belief my mother had for me that she knew that I could be successful that made me just keep going. And when I was eight years old, 
I was in special education classes in school. I can vaguely remember the conversations of the teachers around me that I was probably going to be in special education for the rest of my life. How did I go from that to stand in front of you today? Because right now, I'm a counselor. I teach other people how to talk. I teach other people how to present themselves, how to motivate others. How did I go from point A to where I am now? Repetition and ritual. I overcame my fears by getting out there. When I started speaking and talking, no one understood me, but I kept going. You have to change your rituals. Back to the plane example. I have friends that jump out of perfectly good airplanes. I don't know what's wrong with them. I'm going to call one of them out right now. My uncle slash cousin Greg, Special Forces. Probably one of the baddest guys I ever met in my life. He got out of Special Forces and now he's making a ridiculous amount of money high up in one of the universities doing what he's doing. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Greg. And when he was in the military full time, he used to love jumping out of airplanes. He used to get this excited look in his face. And every time he would talk about it, my look on my face was a little bit different. I'm not afraid of heights, but I'm afraid of falling from them. Okay? So I was, when he would talk about it, he would get excited, and I would like, Greg, please stop talking about jumping out of airplanes, because that's not fun for me. But it led me to some discoveries when working with people with fears. I want you to think about it right now. Those of you that are afraid of heights, I want you to think of you up in the air, thousands and thousands of feet above the ground, and you're standing on the doorway about to jump out the airplane. Some of you stop breathing right then. Some of you right now just stop breathing, even a thought about it, even thinking about it for a moment. I want you to think about that, all the things that are going on in your mind that you're about to jump out of this airplane. And there's nothing wrong with the airplane, you're just gonna jump. And next to you have somebody like my Uncle Greg, who loves jumping out of airplanes. Now, what is the difference between my Uncle Greg who loves jumping out of airplanes, and you that's scared to death jumping out of airplane. I'm going to tell you that if we were to look at just the physical stuff that's going on, it would be very hard to tell the difference. Your heart rate is up because you're scared to death. His heart rate is up because he's excited. You call that emotion fear. He calls that emotion exhilaration. All these emotions are the same. And when you jump out of the airplane, again, He's exhilarated. Oh, and you are like, I am going to die. How can we transform somebody who is scared to death of jumping out of airplanes to somebody who's exhilarated? Well, the military, military does it all the time. There are a lot of people that go to these jumping courses that when they start, they are scared to death to jump out of the airplane. And then somewhere in there, they become excited. They talk about it in a different light. How does that happen? Routine and ritual. Red light, change your routine, change your ritual. First, you have to recognize you even have one. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put the parachute on your back on the ground. You're going to walk on the ground with the parachute on your back. We're getting you used to what's about to happen. How do you do that in your life? This is what I want you to do. Whatever you are scared of, we need to start doing those things with the training wheels on our bicycle first, with the parachute on our back as we're walking on the ground. Too simple. How do I do that? That is, if you're a speaker, speaking by yourself to yourself in the mirror. That's taking your smartphone out and pushing record and recording yourself and watching it. That's going to events that don't really matter, going to free events, going to different places and situations and scenarios that will enable you to be better and do better. That is placing yourself in those situations over and over and over and over again. That's again, cutting off the TV, cutting off Netflix, cutting off Showtime, and enabling yourself to feed your brain, feed who you are and not be afraid to do that. This is how you change your fear. This is how you understand who that is and how we understand that. What is your fear to overcome this? over and over again. Can you overcome your fear? Can you do this and change your ritual and change your routine? The answer is yes, you can. I'll give you another example. When I was in Iraq, for example, and we were rolling into Iraq, a lot of us did not believe that we were going to go to Iraq. And I'm going to tell you a secret about soldiers. We were scared to death. 
We were scared to death of rolling into Iraq. And we did not believe we were even going to roll into Iraq because the people before us in Desert Storm, Desert Shield, they didn't actually go into Iraq. So a lot of us felt that we weren't going to go, that it wasn't going to happen. So what happened? Well, we started to roll into Iraq and we were scared to death. People started shooting at us. We had people in these little, in these little motorcycles with weapons trying to hurt us and missiles coming at us left and right. But something really spectacular began to change within our psyche as we went. We went from being scared to being engaged. We went from being fearful to being excited. And let me tell you how I really noticed this. When we left Iraq and we came home, I lost a few of my friends, not from suicide, as most people would think, from PTSD. I lost a, a few of my friends because they got on their motorcycles they just bought, and they went 120, 130 miles an hour around a curve. They were in that heightened level of excitement. Why? Because we got used to being at this level of excitement. We went from being fearful of it to almost needing it and craving it. And those of us that survived learned that we had to transform these emotions into something else. We had to find something productive to be in. We had to engage it. But, ladies and gentlemen, you have to recognize first, what is your psyche? What are you scared of? Those of you that are entrepreneurs right now, those of you that are listening to this show, and I'm talking to the other motivational speakers, the life coaches, the entrepreneurs, the people that are in the business for themselves, how many projects are you into? How many things do you have on the fire? How many things are you doing right now? Are you a car salesman and an organizer and A, B, and C, and are you doing all these things because you love them and you're passionate about it, or are you engaged in all of these different activities because you're hustling, because you're afraid that if you're not involved, if you're not in all of these things, you will not be able to pay your bills. If you're doing it that way, then you're actually living in fear and you'll never reach prosperity. If I was to tell you that out of the 20 jobs you have, that if you did the car salesman job really well, that you would make over a million dollars next year. You would stop and cancel all the rest of them. I want you to think about that right now. Out of all the things you're doing, if I was to tell you that one of them was going to make you a million dollars today, if the first thing that came to your mind is I'm going to cancel all of those things and focus on that one thing, then that probably means that you're living within fear. But if when I said that to you, the first thing that came to your mind is, well, I, I can't stop doing that because I love it. I can't, stu I can't stop doing that. That's a part of who I am. That's another key, another red light for you to realize you might be in the right profession. You might be in the right field. Throughout this, I'm also going to give you some resources, some things and books you need to read because it's all about what you feed yourself that's really, really important. I want you to think about what you're feeding yourself. I love what Zig Ziglar said about the fight within you. He talked a story that I'm going to share with you today. First of all, I love animals, and I would never do this, but he talked to a gentleman that was in another country, and he had dog fights. And he would fight a white dog, and he would fight a black dog every week. And somehow, no matter what dog he bet on, that dog would win. So one week he bet on the white dog and the white dog would win. And the next week he'd be, be, he bet on the black dog and the black dog would win. And so Zig asked this guy, it's like, tell me, how do you know which dog is going to win? And the man kind of looked at him with a smile in his eye. He said, well, it's easy for me to know which dog is going to win because I bet on whichever dog that I was feeding that week. So my question to you is, what are you feeding? If you're on the couch every day, if you right now took a moment to look at this video and then you're going to spend eight hours watching whatever shows that is in reality TV, I'm going to tell you now, stop being a spectator in life and start being a participator. Red light. Stop being a spectator and start being a participant in your own life. Feed yourself knowledge. Get books on the profession. You don't have to go back to school necessarily in order to be an expert. Do you know how I really started this profession in the first place? Let me tell you how I overcame my fear. My son Isaiah is six years old. And 
when he was two years old, we had a major problem. My son was born in Stuttgart, Germany, and I was in the military at the time. And we moved from Stuttgart, Germany, to Fort Irwin, California, in Barstow. If anybody knows where Barstow is, it's in the middle of nowhere. The Army does that a lot. We train in places similar to where we're going to go. So we're training to go to Iraq, and Iraq is a desert. So we go, let's find somewhere in the middle of nowhere to train, and that's where we were. I tell you that because there also means there's not any medical facilities. My son was diagnosed with epilepsy. Epilepsy means that my son was having seizures, and no one really, know the, no, no one knew, really knew what the cause was for his seizures. And so he, for, before that time, my son had multiple little seizures, but none, nothing really big. I decided that I was going to be a very good husband. So I, in my ultimate wisdom as a husband, decided that I was going to let my wife sleep in, and I was going to wake up my son and take him across the street to daycare so that she could take a couple hours to rest. I went upstairs to get Isaiah, and when I looked down at my baby boy, he was having a major seizure. He was convulsing. And the combat medic in me kicked in. I yelled at my wife to call 911 right now. I picked up my son, and I began to take the steps, one step at a time, downstairs, so that I could lay him down on a flat surface. Well, my expertise from being a combat medic kicked in. And I realized that as I was walking down the stairs, one step at a time, that my baby boy was beginning to die. And by the time I reached the bottom step, I, know, I knew that I knew in my heart or my mind that my son was gone, that he was dead. And for a moment, my fear overwhelmed me. The dad in me started to come out and say, oh, my God, you've lost your baby. And all of a sudden, I heard my wife, a voice that I really was not hearing because I was so focused on the medical care for my son. But the dad in me began to come up, and the medic in me came down, and I heard her in the background say, please, please don't let my baby die. Is he dead? Don't let him be dead. And she was freaking out. And that was a moment that changed my life because I pushed the dad in me down and I pushed up the medic in me. And I believe that all of those experiences, all of that time in the army was for that one moment. And as I laid him down and I breathed life back into him, he opened up his eyes and he looked at me. And here's what changed my life. We were in the middle of nowhere in Barstow, so we had to go hours and hours away in order for him to get medical care to take care of him. When my son came back to the house, he opened up the door, fearless. He ran upstairs in the same room that he almost died in with no fear. And I realized and recognized if this little boy at two years old can be fearless, then why can't I? I realized for me that I was in the military because I was afraid of stepping out on my own. I knew it was in me to be a motivational speaker. I knew it was in me to be a great counselor. I knew it was in me to do these things, but it meant that I had to step outside the zone. And ladies and gentlemen, when you're ready to step out, I want to warn you, when you step out from the crowd, people around you are going to tell you that you can't do it. People around you are going to say, this is insane. And a lot of times when, they, when they're saying these things to you, it's not because they're trying to be malicious or have ill intent towards you. It's because they have tried and they have failed. Or they don't know anybody else has done what you're doing. They're actually doing it out of love. But usually what that means is that you put your foot out there and then you pull it back. Take a moment and think about that for a moment. Once you decide to overcome your fear, once you decide and understand what your fear is, and when you step outside that box, it is not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. There's a great speaker, and I love her. She talks about when you have an idea, it's like birthing a child, and childbirth ain't easy. But women who go through that painful experience are not doing it for the pain. They're doing it for the end result because they know that after all of that pain, after carrying this child around and their back aching, back aching and their legs aching, and they're going through all these 
emotional and physical changes, that the thing that's going to happen is that they're going to have a child, a beautiful baby girl or boy, or multiple ones. You have an idea. You have a passion. You have a dream in you. You have to get past your fears. And when that happens, it will be day one, term one of your labor. And remember, it's going to start. But you have to get past your fears. You have to understand who you are in order to transform those fears. Close your eyes. Think about ways of doing it. But you have to stop asking for the world to be easier and start asking for you to be stronger. Stop asking for the world to be easier and train to become stronger. Stop asking for the world to be easier and coach someone else to be stronger. And what happens over and over again is you become stronger, you are no longer afraid of the things you were afraid of before. Are you ready to go through that journey? Are you ready to push past your fears? The one thing that I realize and recognize when I talk to people and I coach people to push past their fears, I realize one of the greatest fears that I see in the eyes of the men and women I help is that they don't think they have any value. You've been trained that you don't have any value. You're valuable. You are. In a corporation, if you were making the company a billion dollars a year, would they pay you $70 million? Of course they would. But if you're flipping fries at the same organization at the very lowest level, are they going to pay you $80 million to do that? No, it's not going to happen. Why? Because you don't have any value. Your value starts today. Your value does not start once you make the million dollars. It's the journey. What do you want out of your lives? I told you last time that you must, you must start to dream again. 30-day challenge. This is week two of the 30-day challenge. I challenge you now to write down what your fears are. And I want you to pick the number one and number two and find ways to start overcoming it. How do you overcome it? By start changing your rituals today. Cut the TV off today. Engage yourself today. I challenge you because when you look down, you'll realize that your feet have been moving the whole time. Each one of you has a routine that you've been doing. That routine has been going on over and over again. All we're doing right now is changing that routine, just a little bit, to get focused. There's a great show on TV that I really like. It's called Undercover Boss. I love this show because it shows these individuals in the top of their organization. They're the CEOs of the corporation. And what they do is they put on a mask and they put on a mustache and do these different things in order for them to come and work at the lowest level of their organization. And what happens more times than not is that the boss ends up getting fired by their employees. Why? Because it is harder to do the lower end jobs physically than it is to do his job. I want you to really understand and get that. You may be working harder at your job, but that doesn't make you better. The CEO of the corporation is a little different. He is working just as hard as you, but different. He is not working hard on or for the organization. He's been working hard or she's been working hard on themselves. I want you to take that same level of intensity. A lot of you will go to work today, no matter where you're working at, and you will give your job 120% of who you are, and you wonder why you're not reaching the next level. I want you to start to give that same level of intensity, that same level of drive, not towards your job, but towards you. That means feeding your mind feeding the dog. What are you feeding it? Finding books that are going to make you powerful. Today, I want you to take out your phone, take out your iPad, take out your computer, and I want you to go ahead and look up three books. I'm not even going to give you all the information because I want to see whether you have it within you to do the research to find them. The first book is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you look up the multi-millionaires in the United States throughout time from the 1930s on, you will see that almost all of them credit one book 
to help that help them get where they're at. And that book was Think and Grow Rich. Now, what does that tell me? If I know that the people in the United States who have made over a million dollars all have read a book, I should probably read that book. Look it up, get it, download it, download it to your phone, download it to your iPad, live the values and get it done. The second book, believe it or not, is the Bible. I don't care whether you're a Christian or not Christian. A lot of the value systems that came, including the Constitution of the United States, came from a lot of the passages in the Bible. You don't have to read it as a religious document. Pull some ideas, find out where some of the foundations came from or where you're working at today. And the third book is the five love languages. Type in the five love languages. Why am I telling you this? Because you are more than the sum of your parts. If you were to make a cake and you had flour, you had some water, you had some yeast, all the ingredients together, some eggs, and you put it on the table and said, mmm, I would love to eat this cake. Those ingredients individually does not make a cake. You have to mix them at the right proportions at the right time. You have to put them in the oven or the stove and bake them in order for them to be a cake. The same thing. All of you have probably been doing one thing or another right. You probably have the eggs. You probably have the flour. But what you haven't figured out yet is how to mix this combination together to produce the results you want to produce. Because I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you can spend all day and you can put the eggs in a bowl and mix them all day long. And you can stick those eggs in the oven and those eggs will never be a cake. Right now, some of you have been running and running and running and running in circles. Stop running in circles and start running in the right direction. Write down your goals. Write down who you are. Remember I told you, only 10% of Americans write down their goals and have a unified front on where they're going to go next. Don't be in the 10%. That's what you're telling yourself every day when you don't write down your goals. You are telling yourself, I'm not going to be in the 10%. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to be successful. Let's start changing that script. Lastly, I told you before that the person that you have to fight, you have to overcome more than anyone else is yourself. The, the number one person, the number one villain in your life, the number one villain that's trying to hurt you is yourself because the person that talks you out of stuff is you. The one that tells you that you're not good enough is you. The one that says that, you know what, maybe I'm good enough to be on a television show, but I can't do it is you. How do you change that? Well, I'm going to teach you really quickly how to make the invisible visible. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm from Charleston, and I grew up in the Geechee O'Gullah culture. What does that mean? Now, we have this own little language called Geechee O'Gullah that was developed from slaves. And when I was trying to be successful, when I was that little kid, five and eight years old, and I couldn't do, I had a little voice in my head. And I'm going to give you a little knowledge right now. If you ever visit my town in Goose Creek, South Carolina, or Charleston, South Carolina, and you hear my people, I'm going to help you understand them. So, for example, if you want to go down the street, you say street. If you want somebody to come here, you say come yeah. So it would sound something like this. Boy, I don't know your name else. Come yeah. Give me some scar bear and go down the street. Why do I say that? It's because every time that I was trying to be successful, I had a voice on my head telling me that I could not be. I had an invisible voice. So what I did was I gave him a voice and a name. His name is Anthony. And every time Anthony speaks to me, I give Anthony a voice. Before I started this show, Jackie Hill gave me a call and said, I want you to come out and do an interview. And before I even came this direction, Anthony was talking to me. He said, boy, what your name? You crazy? Ain't nobody want to hear you. But since then, I talked to Anthony. I said, Anthony, back up. Get off me. I want you to think about you. Some of you are from the country. Some of you came from nothing. That voice may be more country. I have a best friend. His name is Jimmy. We call him Jimbo. And his voice is like, boy, look here, boy. You can't do that, man. You're just a country boy. But that country boy has achieved more than I can even tell you in one episode. I want you to give that voice a name and a voice. Now, I know to my fellow counselors, if you run into some of the people that I've been coaching that are talking to themselves, they're not crazy. Or maybe they are. That's what I'm actually doing. I'm asking you to be a little insane, to be a little crazy. Because it's those of us that step outside the box. It's those of us that go into a little bit of insanity that reach prosperity, 
Are you willing to reach into insanity to find your prosperity? Are you ready to unlock who you are to be successful? Are you ready to climb up in that water to take your first breath and to grab it each and every day? Are you ready to take the training wheels off and to ride? If you are, then I challenge you on this second episode of this 30-day challenge to overcome your fears, to change your routine and your rituals, to look down at what you're doing and what your feet are doing and put it all together. Find a mentor. Text that accountability partner. Talk to them when you're done with this show. Control who you are. Control your destiny. It is time for you to make that change. It is time for you to make that difference today. Are you ready to do it? This has been Real Talk by Ronald Palmer, here to tell you that you can do it if you believe it. Let's get it done.